The Indie Council is in session. Welcome, everyone. This is a place for the leading voices from across the industry to gather to talk news, titles, and everything indie. I'm your master of ceremonies, Jill Grote, the Indie Informer. And today, we have a full council. It's always fun to see everybody's glowing faces. But joining the council today, we have radiating positivity, Jenny Wyndham. Hello. <laughs> We were just talking the room. (laughs) Yeah. Just before this turned out to be perfect because just before we talked about how the sun had come out because of Jenny and her wonderful positivity. Uh, (laughs) So, you know, it's come true. Uh, Singing through the jump scare, Mike Toundro. Do I have another Celsius? I'm tired. Yeah. Yeah. As many as you need. As a treat. (laughs) But not the way that you go to the hospital. It's a fine line. Yeah, probably better. (laughs) Um, and that voice you hear is the game jamming Janet Garcia. Hello. Um, that on mic <laughs> very close to someone just using the restroom. Not gonna lie. <laughs> um, that was not Mike me. Is from Hello, the toilet I'm here. Today. <laughs> yeah. Always really committed to the show. And yeah. he's joined by some horrible creature we don't want to talk about. Art the Clown, Terror by Three, now out in theaters. I hate it. I hate it so much. I I can't. I don't think I could recommend ever actually looking at an energy drink. It looks disgusting. <laughs> but it and why good. is that? Hey, it just <laughs> looks like pee. It's best not to ask these questions. Yeah, I, yeah. Find, I find the same. <laughs> Janet, you made a game? Yeah, um, it, it, that is true. We submitted it, and it's like a game that we made. Me and Isaiah did a game jam. Uh, it was cool. It was hard. And we scoped down, and then we scoped down again. And then at the end, we're like, we didn't scope down enough. So yep. that's that development, baby. Dev. Yep. <laughs> it's exactly as I feared it would be, which is harder than you can ever conceive of. But uh, yeah, it's on. Um, I tweeted it out at one point. It's on. Uh, if you go to my podcast, the gang cast episode, I want to say 13. It's one that says that it says like metaphor, our Lucky first game, 13. whatever. My favorite. Indie yeah, game. it's it's got our uh, yeah, our, our game over there, which, you know, the funny thing that I keep mentioning back to Isaiah, obviously we're like, okay, this didn't turn out the way we wanted it, but whatever, we submitted it. That's the point of doing a jam. He's jammed before. It was my first jam. Um, is I'm like, you know, even though we didn't have time to code in the ending of the game, so it literally just doesn't end, <laughs> and we thus made a strange work simulator, I'm like, I'm going to spin this as positive. I'm like, yeah. you got to reframe what a game could be, you know? Open mm-hmm. your open your mind's eye. Um, it sounds and in like doing the kind that, of thing- you can kind of see a game. We would definitely be interested. In, like, you guys, the game doesn't end. It's oh so God. meta what is and it cool. Saying? It's kind of... Yeah, what is it saying the, with, like, the metaphor The metatextual commentary. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it was fun. I, you know, would hope to do other stuff at some point, but... Yeah, thank you for mentioning it. I suppose it was so <laughs> cool. Like, you can like, click on it if you want to and see what we made, but I'm not like uh, you know heavily <laughs> pushing it for uh, reasons that it's not at all done. But we are hoping to eventually like revisit it and maybe put it on like Isaiah once he gets his itch page going and he does more of his own dev stuff that can yeah. live there. That's awesome. And we're definitely Thanks. gonna check it out and. Uh, well, I'll try to find. I'll, I'll get. I'm gonna get the link. I'm gonna get the link. I'm gonna put in the doobly doo, so everyone's gonna go check it out. I heard it's okay, yeah, I can send it to you. I can send yeah. it to you. I heard it's yeah. better than ever. It's got a lot of buzz. <laughs> uh, speaking of big games coming up, let's switch over to indie news and talk about Xbox Partner Preview coming up tomorrow. That is Thursday, October seventeenth at ten a.m. Probably people will be watching this just after seeing it it's likely it'll be on the same day so at the moment we don't know what's going to be there we did get an official announcement for the partner preview um that was basically they mentioned a few games but they didn't have any indie games but these partner previews do tend to have indie uh representation so last march the partner preview included Sleight of Hand, The Altars, Creature of Ava, Frostpunk 2, Tales of Kinsara Zao, and The Sinking City 2. So with that in mind, let's do some predictions. What do we think is going to show up tomorrow? Hard to say. We've got a lot of thinking faces. I, my first thought, 
and maybe this is silly, but we did just get Claire Obscura uh, Expedition 33. We got information on the revealed voice actors, including like mm-hmm. Andy Serkis, Ben Starr, and Charlie Cox. So I'm wondering with this kind of preceded news information, if they're kind of trying to plant the seeds of excitement so that it'll show up tomorrow. Is there a date on that? I don't think I so. Don't, no, no, there isn't. I will say that's the one game where I was like, because it's a Kepler published game. And I was like, so sad to leave Kepler because of this game specifically. <laughs> uh-huh. So I'm very happy that the news is finally out. <laughs> Um, but I don't think there's a date officially out. Yeah, no, it's just maybe tomorrow, 2025 at some point. Who knows? Yeah, I don't it's know. Weird. I mean, indie stuff is so hard to predict. Are, are there any like big Xbox aligned indies that we haven't seen in a while, except for Silk so Song? The, yeah, the one, <laughs> no one say the name of this game. Like, if I see this in my chat, I'm, I'm like, gonna just put a dollar in the you. swear jar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the two that I'm thinking from. Summer Game Fest that we saw is Winterboro and Mixtape. Mm. Um, yeah. Winterboro showed up again at PAX West. Um, so they've got mm-hmm. stuff. They're they're cooking. Um, and the Mixtape one might be an interesting pull just because they are Annapurna Interactive published. Um, Counterpoint is, that. is Annapurna in a state to <laughs> prepare an announcement so soon? <laughs> right. That's what I'm wondering. Like, is that an issue is that going to be an interesting point of topic if that shows up Um, it definitely is um it's funny i was looking at mixtape today actually i think it's a good poll that you had to reference it even though the annapurna of it does make it kind of like hmm i'm not sure like when we'll kind of see them next but um they i think mentioned it even on their their youtube thing like day one game pass which granted game pass is in a funky spot which we've already discussed you know many episodes ago but (laughs) It's still, I think, very much leading with like Xbox branding in a lot of ways. So I think that, that's a mm-hmm. a good one to nod to. And it's been a little while. With Winter Borough, I wonder, I know there's always that question of like, is there such a thing as oversaturation for a game? Mm-hmm. In a lot of ways, I'd argue no. But at the same time, I do wonder if we'd see it again. Because we also just saw it at Gamescom as well. But that also tells me they're consistently like plugging it as part of like, hey, we're Xbox, here are our games. And like, this is our indie that we're propping up uh you know it seems like they're really uh focusing on on marketing that one a lot yeah 100 mm-hmm. percent. did that did all y'all play the demo for winterboro mm-hmm. yeah like i don't know if you got to play it a long time but i'm really surprised with how kind of somber it was <laughs> like there's a lot of death spoiler alert for winterboro mm-hmm. like i looked at you look at it and it's a cute little hand-drawn mouse game that looks like it's going to be about decorating uh a lot of death happens in there so prepare and yourself a lot of for that it's got, it's got a lot of decorating for everyone. yeah you can decorate yeah. with the bones it's fine these yeah the story <laughs> even just like the story i think is surprisingly deep even though it's mm-hmm. like it's a pretty simple like storybook construction but their setup of oh your parents like left the borough to like live in the big city but the city wasn't what they thought it'd be and they were just working this like really whack bad job for them physically (laughs) until they died before they could save up enough money to go back it's like very like like an interesting construction and a pretty like serious one in terms of like motifs that it's covering and then they're like and now you can go make a sweater i'm like okay like (laughs) tears pouring out my face i miss my mom like you know make a sweater before you die so yeah speaking of dying (laughs) hades too so I was, I, I was kind of thinking, do you think like the, I think a Hail Mary announcement would be put Hades 2 in the in the preview program because they, oh, yeah. they have their own version of early access. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That'd be Can cool. you remind me like what what it, what does that look like? Uh, for it's very similar to just how early access on Steam works. Like I we have uh, uh, Slime Rancher 2 on Xbox, for example. It's just like an EA version of, of a game program. It works very similarly. It just acts like, you know, a normal game. But just with all the caveats that like it's not the full launch and maybe it's a little discounted or whatever so like i think if they threw super giant enough money they could easily get hades on there 
Right. Because mm-hmm. they have Power World in that program as well. Right Power now, World's right? on there. They they had um yeah. some survival game was on there for a long time. They they typically throw uh preview stuff alongside Game Pass stuff. So I feel like that could be a pretty huge Game Pass kind of maneuver as well. Yeah. That makes total sense. Especially since we just got the uh news that Hades two has the Olympic update. Uh, dropped and posted it. and it's a big one thanks for dropping uh, it in the middle of next fest Super right Giant. in the middle of next fest so now i'm like okay that's a new no- that's a new thing i have to play um but the drop includes things like a totally new region new weapons new characters more story dialogue cosmetics etc etc so it seems like there's really a reason to jump back in and check everything out if that is what you are interested in doing of course there's all kinds of like fixes and balances and all these kinds of things um but yeah it's definitely an interesting time to do that if they weren't thinking about other things so maybe it is a really good uh reason to have dropped it right now once you punch yeah because like randomly on the middle of the steam next fest wednesday seems like odd timing for this but we will and have and to see. you mentioned Ben Starr earlier. Ben Starr, one of the voices of in in Hades too. I forgot his name. I oh, forgot okay, the okay. name. <laughs> I, I saw a tweet earlier. He's the voice of the update. You can go and he will read it. <laughs> he I is would patch to it if zero he did. three whatever. <laughs> uh, also reads the Indian former. Does do he? I, do I do I believe it? I don't know, but he told me to to my face. So I'm not going to question. <laughs> uh yeah i again hades 2 is going to be like game of the year when it drops it's it doesn't have a specific date but i think it has the 2025 window yeah i'm, st- I'm curious sort of nodding i'm curious how many of these major updates right. there are yeah and how many yeah. it takes i know i'm trying game. to look to see I'm on their Steam page right now I'm trying to see if they have like a roadmap. I'm like scrolling back because right. when did this yeah. when did it drop? May. May. May okay. 6th. Yeah. So two major updates a year. Maybe. So maybe holiday mm-hmm. next year. That would make sense. Maybe we'll find out tomorrow. Maybe, maybe. people watching this already know and they're like, we we don't need this speculation because we have knowledge. What comes first? Hades 2 1.0 or Silk Song? Hades 2 1.0. Hades 2. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I want to say the other one, but I can't say the name of the game. So. <laughs> you have no more dollars to toss in the, in the swear jar. I have no jar. more dollars to toss in the swear jar. So let's head over to topic of this show. Constructing virtual conventions. Um, I, I'm very interested in the way that the modern landscape of like virtual conventions is kind of... Uh, folding out originally steam next fest which is going on right now and we've already mentioned it uh it was a reaction to covid and and like you can go back and we have a whole like history of steam next fest um and it was meant to be a hands-on convention for people who could not go physically to um was it it was a Keeley joint. Was it Summer Game Fest or that was before Summer Game Fest? Well, Summer Game Fest, I think the first Summer Game Fest was COVID, wasn't it? Possibly. But that, was it the, was... that was the weird first year where it lasted four months and we were all Yes, and it was exhausted. so long. And yeah, it was during lockdown. So... so we have gone from that kind of nebulous, like framing it as a... Con- like a convention you would go to and play games but virtually and it seems to be kind of growing and swelling and transforming into kind of a totally different thing um just for funsies i went back and i looked at like the format of that kind of virtual convention of years past during covid and like 2020 2021 time um devolverland expo is still on steam you can go and play that right now. And it's fantastic. And that, it's so much fun. Mm-hmm. I I love that they do this. Devolver Digital is always really fun with its, like, all of its ideas for the most part. And they're always so silly. The weird thing is, though, when you go back and look at this now, they couldn't have known it at the time. But this is a strangely 
good experience like if you've never been to e3 to go back and see what it was really like because it's like it is the la convention center and you are going through it except for like the lines that took forever like this is actually a really good like simulator for e3 um which makes me weirdly nostalgic i don't know did y'all did y'all play this devolverland yeah Mm -hmm. mm-hmm mm-hmm it's been so long. I actually kind of forgot. <laughs> I forgot that it about existed. It until, yeah, yeah, until now. So this is kind of like a nice splash from the past memory. Who um who developed that? It was was it the Gumbrella folks? Doinksoft? I think it was Doinksoft, right? Flying Wild Hog. Uh, oh, it was maybe... Flying Wild Hogs. Yeah. So the uh, Trek to Yomi. Trek to Yomi folks. Yeah. 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 Man. Yeah, it was really cool. And they, yeah, definitely they a moment put, in time. They put sure. a bunch of like Easter eggs in there for like unannounced games and they were like teasing things and it was super fun. I wish more people would do stuff like that, but obviously it takes a lot of bandwidth and resources right. to develop a game just to have a promotional kind of thing. Right. So cool. The other big one that I can remember from this time period, 2020 and 2021, uh, Indie Arena Booth did a actual <laughs> virtual. You create a character and you walk around uh it was essentially gamescom that you could go around and look through and and play demos when you walked up to the booth and then you could like wish list it on steam but by looking at like the posters and stuff if you look at the actual rundown i'll have a link for 2021s if you look at the rundown between what happened between 20 and 20 and 2021 it's wild because it's like the original attempt at this, developers had to create their own booths, which is kind of normal in a physical space, but like they had to program it. And for a lot of people, it was hours and hours and they're talking about like 30 hour booth uh, programming. So in like on top of doing everything else, all these pro all these developers are trying to program the actual booths. They looked fantastic, though. They were so like everything had its own theme and everything was so on point the next the 2021 wasn't quite as um vibrant but i'm glad that people didn't have to work as hard as they did but unlike devolvers uh i devolver land expo game i mm -hmm. remember both years of the in the arena booth because i was <laughs> one of those developers yeah. what was that experience oh my gosh it's lots of long nights so um i do remember 2021 being infinitely better but honestly like the this was one of those experiences that i had that i was like really cool idea didn't really feel like the execution panned out in terms of like people participating and feeling like i just remember it was very weird because like there was some connectivity issues and people like didn't quite know how to navigate and i think most people ended up just like looking at the demos and stuff on steam <laughs> anyways um but it was really fun and i'm really happy that like these things were tried you know it's like we tried yeah they didn't all go as planned but you know i'm glad we had this moment of trying to make things work together <laughs> yeah. do you remember e3's digital thing no Where we did like any of y'all did or i think it was the year before i think i think it was the 2020 e3 where it was it was digital only and like it was it was the only year i got a media badge for e3 and uh it was it was kind of a shit show where like the whole back end was broken there were there were like virtual booths but like none of them really did anything nobody really participated in it i think there was like i think maybe capcom had like a section in there but it didn't really it wasn't like worth like covering or like there wasn't really anything to it it was very strange mm -hmm. you had to create like your own like e3 avatar and there was a I massive a there was a massive leak and everybody's information was out there that. because of it yeah, yeah. i remember that <laughs> yeah that was such strange times Weird time there was too. another one that i can remember for specifically game informer when i was working there there was a virtual uh gamestop conference um <laughs> and <laughs> It was a same thing. It was so like connectivity issues. It was so weird. You had to create your own avatar and it was our job to man our booth. So like yeah. our avatars in real life, I had to not be writing and I had to stand virtually behind a booth to like <laughs> talk to people who would be interested. And if you were talking, 
everyone and every single floor could hear you talk. Like it was so bizarre. Um, so yeah, I love that we had this period of time where this was actually happening. Um, but we have moved on to a much more, I think, plausible, uh, user-friendly experience. So let's talk about Steam Next Fest, October of 2024. Present day, we have made it. How do y'all approach these kinds of events versus an on-site convention? Um, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, uh, thank God I'm not a drinker or a smoker. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's or else that's how that's, I would approach it nowadays. It's just all of that Celsius yeah. right now. Yeah, I mean, on the PR side of things, Next Fest, like let's say October, Next Fest actually starts at the end of August. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of planning and pitching out demos and making sure you you're booking paid influencers and stuff like that, it's a nightmare, and it's just constantly like tracking charts and you're praying to God that Valve's backend ain't broke. Guess what? It currently is broken. None of the charts are actually working right now, which is a nightmare mm-hmm. in terms of trying to track clients' games and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it, on, on the PR side, it's it's a struggle, and yeah, it's it's a big old fight. But um, yeah, on the media side, I I feel like it changes every single time, just because it seems like Next Fest just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which is a good thing, but also maybe not the best thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I've noticed like in particular this year or, uh, for, for October, there are some games that are launched that are a part of next fest. I don't know what happened there. Like I, I was looking through just like scrolling through lists. I came across a couple games of like, Oh, I think this looks really cool. Let me click it and hit the demo. Oh, it came out in July and September and don't know what happened there. Um, for context, if your game is launched, you are not valid or eligible mm-hmm. to participate in right. next fest. So in next fest. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's definitely some stuff there that makes it tricky, but, um, yeah, I feel like it coverage changes every time. Like we used to try to do write-ups and roundups per editor or per journalist, um, try to do like daily streams, try to do obviously just big old podcasts, stuff like that for this one. I think on Friday after work, me and Kyle are going to hop on a Patreon stream and just like pick a bunch of demos and, and just hang out and play. I think that's kind of like the most viable thing nowadays, just cause, uh, there's way too much going on, unfortunately, that I don't have time to play video games in general, let alone a ton of demos. But um, mm-hmm. but yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think what's interesting is with each Next Fest, at least from like the marketing PR side, it feels like a race to, uh, I don't know 100%. if race to the bottom is exactly the right phrase, but it <laughs> is like it is starting earlier and earlier. Like initially, like with the first next fest, it's like we'd get the emails or we'd send out the emails like two weeks before. And then it was like, oh, we're sending out emails a month before. I know as a content creator, I was receiving next fest demo emails like almost two months before mm-hmm. the next fest was happening, which was uh-huh. like, I mean, on one level, nice because I'm like, okay, I'm planning, but also I'm like, that is feels like a little bit too far ahead for me. Um, and as someone who does marketing and content creation on the marketing side, the pressure to like be ready earlier and earlier each fest is like kind of present. I think we'll hopefully hit a cap at like the three month mark, but um, that definitely. Jenny, what is- if I told you I had no, a meeting? Please, nope. A meeting today about the February, <laughs> March next fest. Honestly, <laughs> we're all like, that's I'm working wild. with teams and we're talking February next fest. And so it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, it is continuously becoming an earlier port part of planning um, for better or worse. And I think from the content standpoint, this next fest has been particularly interesting. I feel like um, we've talked about the saturation of the fests and also just like the number, the frequency of them seems to make it mm-hmm. so that the, significance becomes not necessarily less in terms of wish list numbers, but it does make it less of a priority for creators the more used to it we become. And I've noticed there are less there's just less coverage on this next fest. Um that being said, there's some really good games, but because the charts are kind of wonked wonky and broken, it's been harder to like find some of the gems. Mm-hmm. Um but I guess that's why we're also here to help people <laughs> find them. Yeah. Um but yeah it's How do interesting. You... Twenty seven hundred games plus uh, is that what the number is yeah it's Dang. like almost three thousand demos it's insane it feels like ten thousand when I it go does on it. Yeah. like i i think um next is interesting because i didn't well it's not 
necessarily that that old, but I didn't really start doing much coverage with it until like a few next fest ago where I'm like, you know what? I'm finally going to stand up and go sit down and play <laughs> some of these games. And it can be really fun from like the content perspective because like one of the best things to do is like taste test stuff. I can taste test stuff all day, committing, finishing, and then p- hence writing something after hell hell on earth it's like mm-hmm. oh my god i gotta finish it oh and then i gotta write it's like that's such an insurmountable task while to your point mike like jumping on a stream streaming is still hard like i don't want to discount streaming but when you're done with the stream the stream is done with you you know you walk away and mm-hmm. maybe i mean obviously you might have post-production stuff like vods or if you want to edit social clips but boom the content was made you just made it Versus something um, in a different format, whether it is clip outs or articles, that's going to be another lift. Um, but yeah, like it's it's tough because there's a lot to go through. And I think depending on how you want to do your stuff, if you're doing just Rex, there's always that for me, there's that feeling of, well, maybe I should spend more time with these before I recommend them. And some demos can be there's also no. um set like length for the demos which i think is generally fine but then you do run into you know you had to brought this up in terms of like in person versus virtual like how are they different how are they the same like you kind of run into the problem that sometimes i run into with even appointments and like a real life thing where i'm like ah, i didn't need 30 minutes or an hour to see your game necessarily i just needed like a bit but then you kind of want to see all of it because it's like that's what the demo was and like that's the mm-hmm. slice they presented but you also don't usually have that information even surface to you maybe sometimes on the page, they might say the length of the demo, but it's like, am I almost at the end of the demo? Is the demo actually like mad long? Like there's not really as much of a sense of time. So you do have to kind of figure out what you're going to do, what limitations you're going to put on yourself for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the pro side of things, I do think you can go through stuff like stupid fast. And then if, if I'm not streaming, I'm going through things even faster. Like I'll play a game for like one minute and be like, no next and then yep. just keep you just keep going it's next fest because i'm on to the next game you know and you just <laughs> go through it which i noticed some people might seem like a bit like crass and shallow but it's like this is just between me and my steam you know it's like, i don't know what has to know <laughs> if i'm not streaming it when i stream i go for a little longer just for the sake of well i want everyone to see a game so if i picked it let's give it like five to ten minutes or something um but yeah i think my only beef beef with next fest at this point is the filtration yeah ain't great Mm-mm. I'm like, okay, platformers. And they're like, this is a mystery horror puzzle game. I'm like, I don't think you're really a platformer. Now, if you have jumping, like I get people probably want to like hit whatever tags to get whatever thing, but it makes for the, yeah. the search experience becomes worsened because, you know, some people might have tags that are more like fifth in what their genre would be described as. And it's like, ah, like I kind of wish only this had this. And, and I wish those lines were drawn a little bit clearer for the sake of searching up stuff how do you guys feel about the timing i think february is fine but i feel like june and october is getting a little too much i think october yeah. being like in the thick of it right now between mm-hmm. the AAA side of things and you know just for just talking about general populace and maybe not necessarily us but but i think jenna and jenny are playing this game like metaphor is taking over right now a lot of people mm-hmm. surprisingly mm-hmm. are super into uh silent hill Dragon Age is right around the corner. Call of Duty is here. And how do you actually compete with uh, with those kind of games? Like 2,700 indie games uh, on top of some of the heavy hitters that do garner the clicks, the attention, the viewership, the followership. Um, I think it's just getting a little overwhelming. And then talking about June, you know, Next Fest is happening. Usually while we're all at Summer Game Fest yeah. or while all these showcases are happening, I think maybe the... I, I think Jeff tried it during SGF this past year, like at least mentioning it on stage, like maybe making it an actual part of SGF would be a more appropriate spin if Jeff can make that deal with Valve. Um, but yeah, it's just it, it being a separate thing. It's just its own whole overwhelming additional thing to cover on top of all these other events, on top of us being on the ground in LA, on top of the massive wave of Q4 launches that tend to happen every uh, uh october even talking about february for next year but it looks like february is getting again incredibly stacked with triple a releases with like yeah. monster hunter like a dragon so that's just mm-hmm. more triple a stuff on top of probably another close to three thousand indie games vying for attention in uh yeah. in 2025 i'd be really curious 
to see if they've ever, because I haven't looked, but now I'm curious if they've published any data. It's Valve, so probably not. But on not. the difference between the next fests, because I would imagine there are probably stronger next fests. And in my head, I feel like October, honestly, would be a weaker one, um, personally. You would think. But. Yeah, and so I'm very curious to see like if they have what data they have to inform like oh we actually needed more because originally Next Fest I think was I don't know if it was only one time a year or two but it was like not yeah it was like quarterly once. yeah yeah you know? it was and now one it's- and I I think it was only like a handful of games also like a very curated yeah. handful of games. Yeah, I think it, it was like, with like 30, 40 games. Or if something. that 30 or 40. Oh man. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was really right, low. Yeah. You could actually play them all. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was like a short hike, self loss, like mm-hmm. really, really curated, which is yeah. good and bad. Like obviously like I think the point of next fest is for everybody to get their shot. And like, I totally appreciate that. And you know, not to throw shade at any, any games. There are some cash grabby games that, uh, you know, not to, again, not to judge or anything, but like you kind of tell what those games are. Um, that tend to flood the charts quite a bit. Um, yeah. I also think like I always find it a little weird when like for this next fest, for example, like Marvel Rivals is a part of this next fest. I feel like it doesn't need to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but I guess Steam Next Fest isn't technically an. It's indie not technically festival, an indie so. show. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think. Oh man, I had a thought and it my brain just evaporated. So never mind. Continue. I will I, say it if I think of it again. <laughs> I want to jump on Mike's um, making Steam Next Fest and Summer Game Fest a kind of thing. And I really think that the Steam events have spiraled kind of out from this original Next Fest idea to be this kind of virtual thing that I'm seeing so many more of these virtual festivals associated with you know, maybe showcases or something else that's going on and bigger, more interest in these festivals as well. I think there's two sides of that. There's like, I think what you're referring to in terms of like, let's say like Wholesome Games does the Wholesome Directa and there's the Wholesome Steam event. 6-1 Ooh. has our showcase. There's the this, this Steam event. Ludonaricon has their yeah. thing. There's the Steam event. But then there's also like the actual Valve events as well, like just thinking off the top of my head, like Scream Fest, local co-op fest, trains and automobiles fest, all yep. real things, by the way. Um, yeah. Good artwork, too. Very, very good artwork. Yeah, it's like I kind of wish – I don't know. Like I almost wish like those other festivals got as much – I don't know if notoriety is the, the correct term or I, I guess love and attention from media and influencers as – next fest does to take some of the pressure off of next fest Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's tough because you go and you see like trains and automobiles and roguelike and it's like a new festival every week and you just can't keep on top of it yeah whereas like next fest is like okay it's the one thing i would love to see next fest drop uh june personally and become yeah, curated to the point i know that it's sort of a talking point for steam next fest to be like you could never play all these games if you lived 100 years or whatever um i hope you live 100 years you know what i mean but <laughs> lucky if I live um, 50. <laughs> with all that celsius you'd be drinking but yeah no i i wish they would curate it down to some sort of manageable level like still to the point where you couldn't play them all if you wanted to, but um, I, I like I've had troubles with this Steam Next Fest specifically. I got really frustrated because I keep we all talked about it during last week's secret section um, of how long our wish lists are, and I keep a wish list curated and updated so that I know what's going on and what's coming up. Um, and I go every Steam Next Fest. I go to the like. These are the things on your wish list. And it's got like 10 things. And I'm like, I know my wish list is 450 games long. I know I have more wish list games on here. Um, and I would love to play the demos of those. So I would like that to be a more viable option rather than just here are the 10 that we randomly decided are the most important for you. I think talking about the curation of it and like it is like a touchy subject of like you don't want to gatekeep like you don't want to restrict folks all that stuff but like 
I do agree. I think it, it, I think there needs to be a ceiling in place because 2700 does nobody favors. I don't think like yeah. you only get one yeah. next fest. And if let's say you're a, if you're game number 2699 on the charts and a, you know, ain't going to be beneficial for you. So why burn that one shot you got? It's like I think like capping it at like a 500 would be lovely. I would love if there was like a stipulation in place like for for actually qualifying for a next fest. That like let's say for the March next fest or I, I think it's end of February early March it, it's weird for 2025. Um, it would be wonderful if the games the only games eligible are launching anytime before the June next fest because that, that's when it's most beneficial for games anyways. Where it's like, or in my opinion, everybody has different philosophies with that. Typically, I always recommend devs like do like if you're launching in late may for example do the february march next fest to build up that traction so i think it would be wonderful if um there is a stipulation of like okay you're launching between march at march 1st and i guess technically like march 5th or whatever march 5th and may 31st you're eligible for spring or early spring next fest but you're not eligible for june or october like maybe like some sort of stipulation like that um because like well, I, I I'm, I'm sure there's have... some I'm sure there's some games that like are not launching until 2026 that are in this current next fest. Yeah, and I think they do have a stipulation. Like I think they say you have to release within. It's broad. Like I think they can narrow it down for sure. But I think it's like within the next year. Is it? I I thought it was as long as your page is set to coming soon. Oh dang! Really? I I think that's what it is. Okay. Ver- coming soon versus like to be announced or whatever. Yeah. And I think they did try to incentivize that because you can only participate in one next fest now. You, in the original next fest, you could do it as many times. I remember yeah. Garden Story, we like did three next fests before they put in that rule. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah, I, I see them trying to find ways to create those caps without outright saying like only because if you say only five hundred games can participate, that's like is that who has the most wish list? Is that whoever submits right. in time? Like what's, you know, and that's that's really who tough. has the least wish list. We gotta do it yeah. like sports, where when yeah. you yeah. Right. Bottom, golf rules, <laughs> not literally, because obviously this will be bad. But like, it's like there should be. It's like at a certain point, you're like doing bad enough that you get like the first pick in the draft, right? So it's like right. that. There's something there because I do think, unfortunately, like s- things will always favor what's already more popular. And I kind of mm-hmm. watch off this too, like. Jill, I think it's interesting that you're like, oh, I'm, I want to get in on the stuff I have wish listed, which I think is fair because you um, like generally pursue like content threads more aggressively than I do. Like you're like, oh, yeah, I saw it. I wish listed it. I previewed it. Yep. I reviewed it and I sent it out into the pasture afterwards or whatever. <laughs> and I'm more like, ah, I don't know really what I got going on here. So like my wish list is not as curated. And I kind of look for more of the stuff that I didn't like. I'll, I played a couple things on my wish list. But I want stuff that I never saw to add to my wish list, which is to say that also everyone goes into it with different desires or expectations. Like there certainly are people yeah. who are like, hey, I just kind of want to play like the hottest stuff, the stuff that's good. They might not even participate in this because you're like, hey, let me know what y'all find. I don't want to you know, be involved. But I think if they could cater more towards the different purposes people go to Next Fest, because like I kind of want to see the stuff that, you know, the deeper cuts, right? Like what? maybe isn't going to be picked up on by other outlets or other creators. And then, you know, through that, I feel like we can all kind of share what we got and, you know, we'll have some overlap. Mm-hmm. Sure. But there may be some things that are unique to it. Um, yeah. I think I just hope to see more, I think, continued iteration on the the main page. Like I'm looking at it now. And one thing that they have that I think has some potential is like, they have like a discovery queue where you can like click in and sw- like kind of like a slideshow, like click through, different Mm -hmm. games that they like queue up for you i don't know what they base it on but i feel like something like that is heading towards an interesting potential setup like if someone could make like a like a tinder for steam demos for next where you can kind of (laughs) because they try to do the algorithm like hey you've played like a turn-based tactics game i'm like yeah but like i don't really play a lot of them and i know you don't really know me because you told me here's my turn-based tactics section i'm like i've played like two turn-based games so a way like whether it's through surveys, through like applications that are made that are a little bit more like putting the onus back on the user who does know their taste and then kind of meeting in the middle would be some really cool things to see, I think, in NextFest and integrated mm-hmm. within NextFest or the, and or the Steam app. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how often do you actually find games? 
that you are like, I didn't know about this before, but now I've played it. It's awesome. And I've got it on my list. Because I think for me, that doesn't happen that often. Um, I is think- your list just really big? Or do you think you're like, mm, the other reason, you know, like which is fair game. I think we're also think- a rare exception. Yeah, because I think you, you like Jill. You're one of the people who I'm like. We're so, you're so in tune with what's going on, and I think all of That's us are thing, like. Yeah, we all know so much of what's happening that yeah. we're a biased audience. Like I was also thinking, kind of to extend Janet's line of thinking of like who is the next fest for, and like maybe for us because we're consuming all of the dis- all of these different points of content in the game industry, like it's coming at overwhelming times, but for an average consumer, maybe these, this, the structure of the fest work. And it's just like hard for us. Cause we're like, dang it, we're in, involved in all of the things. Um, right, right, right. And so, yeah, I think, and like the co-op uh, steams, like themed festivals, I think are, I actually quite like them knowing that most of them are not for me. Like the planes, trains, automobiles, yeah. I'm like, nah, that's not it. Co-op, no, I'm not interested in it. But I'm like, if you are one of those people and you happen to know that fest is happening, that's really cool. The problem with those festivals is I think the public generally has no idea that they're happening. (laughs) And so if like those could be amplified more and maybe find ways to curate and like limit and cap the Steam Next Fest somehow, I feel like there could be more of this balance of, okay, Steam Next Fest, the purpose, maybe that's going to be for discovery of like what's coming up next in terms of time. But then you have these curated thematic events that hopefully people can resonate with in other ways and like help spread out for at least the general consumer. For us, again, it's like that's so much happening. But for general people, I think they're not paying attention to everything. (laughs) So yeah. I just had this idea based off of Janet saying sports. I was like, what if we made it like a tournament where you have all of these demos in these specific planes, trains, automobiles, and then whichever ones do numbers have a chance to get to the Steam Next Fest. And I also had like that big, I thought yeah. as well, which I don't think they should do, but I did have that no, thought. Of but like, it'd be fun. Everyone takes one, like... <laughs> Like Indie my game even demo version, Royale. like every publisher gets one game <laughs> that you can put out, and that's kind of it. No, that probably wouldn't work, but I think it does speak to just the idea of you know getting it to be a little bit me- meaningfully like a me- meaningful diversity, I think, is what mm-hmm. is wanted from something like this. Like, mm-hmm. you can have a lot of stuff. I don't want to say it's easy to have a lot of stuff because obviously, Steam's still like you know, Valve's doing the work of having the platform and everything, but like. If they wanted, they could just open this up to everybody, right? They don't necessarily want every game under the sun to be in here. So they have, like, the, you know, okay, they have the theme of, like, the release date, but, like, maybe that has some problems. And then there's also the, like, okay, yeah, exactly. Who is it serving on the the dev side? And, like, what ways can, like, is it still beneficial? Like, does, can it get too big where it isn't as beneficial to the developers that are taking part of it? Um, yeah, I'd be curious to know if they even know the answer to this. If there's, like limits they have in mind themselves is like setting up next fest where they're like oh we're gonna have we're gonna hard lock it at like 5k like it's never gonna go above that or if they're just like hey man people keep making games yeah i can't find it i've been trying to scroll through his blog but um chris zukowski he does a lot of like curation of like data from different studios and he also offers like analysis of trends that happen within indie game marketing particularly and i feel like there was an article i think from the june next fest and he talked about how if you're not within i think it was like the top basically two refreshes of the chart, you know, if you're looking at like top trending demos, if you're not within sort of that range of being able to scroll within like the top 20 or maybe 40 demos, it's sort of not that helpful. Um, And so it's one of those things. And this is why developers and publishers are racing to try and get ahead, like releasing their demo ahead of the next fest so they can boost their wish lists and get in the algorithms. And like, that's why all this sort of meta is happening. Um, And so I think that's a really good point that I think everyone's kind of brought up in different ways where it's like, how beneficial is this for developers? If you're in a festival where there's almost 3000 demos, like if you're not in the top 50, you're probably not getting very many wish lists. Yeah. But on the other side of things, like when I do like find a game that I was unaware of before and it hits, it really hits because it's like a really cool thing. And like we're all here talking about Next Fest. So 
obviously there is something very culturally important to mm-hmm. the atmosphere, the event itself. Yeah. Um, I and I love hearing people talk about it. So uh, unless y'all want to chew over more of the nuts and bolts, let's head over to our favorite demos of the event so far. So we're only about halfway through at this point. I haven't I haven't dug in as far as I would like to. Um, so we're gonna just name off our top three so far. Um, and I think we've sort of kept it so that we're not overlapping each other. Uh, Janet, do you want to throw out your top three? Yeah, um, my top three is a top two because I had a hard time <laughs> curated making time You're for keeping it. it curated, um, you know? Janet just yeah. played so many games, and it's just so yeah. hard to pick. Yeah, three, honestly, you know? I did download Actually. like I ain't trying to shade any games. I downloaded quite a few games, and these were the two I wanted to share. I didn't want to put a third just to just to be like, all right, I got the did the assignment. Um, so instead, I did it incorrectly, and I have two. Uh, one of them is keep driving. This is probably my main standout. I it's funny. I got also a PR emailed on this but for those i kind of just i'll wish list some of those and then i'm like i'm just gonna go to the fast regular regular and like see what what kind of pops up um but this is a uh which i'm sure pr hates because it's like no please just play i'm like i don't i don't know if i'm gonna get to anything here um yeah like it's a management game where you're like dri- the premise is you're driving a car to like beat your friend and you're like bringing like make sure to bring your favorite game and you like packed your video game there and you can pick up like other items as well it's kind of um i was talking to the remap crew about this earlier and they kind of a, a liken it to oregon trail which i think is it has some similarities for yeah. sure but it's more it's like that meets inventory management like resident evil style yep. like, like mm-hmm. putting the filling the squares but also meets like turn-based combat in a sense because yeah. basically what happens is you're driving down is you'll encounter these different road events um like the one that i encountered was i was behind a tractor it's like okay that's slowing down the car so then you have to sort of they present it like via icons where there will be like iconography at the bottom that you have to like defeat and you have like skills that you can use and you're trying to match basically just like what the um like which icon it's like referring to and then once you like clear them they're cleared and you can skip them but then you're automatically take the damage from them um so yeah you have like threats that come up that are representing one of your resources your resources being energy cash durability and gas and then you're kind of like managing these different aspects as you're trying to hopefully get to the end of your journey and i think the soundtrack's incredible the art is this great like pixel but like high def hyper detailed pixel art and there's just like so much flavor, even in this like very, very small time I spent with it of just like the second you get into the game, they have like a little, you know, put your name, you know, you pick your driver, like, you know, like, are they masculine? Or are they feminine? And then you rate your relationship with your parents on a scale of one to five. And the second yeah. I saw that, I was like, boom, good game or good demo, at least. Right. Will the game be good? We'll see. But immediately I was like, this has pizzazz it has personality there's something here then you pick what your um job is and like what you're bringing and you can bring a, a different stuff i brought the beer with the guitar which yeah. i'm sure is like not going to be useful because it takes up a huge slot in your inventory yes but i'm like okay maybe along the way i can like crack open a cold one responsibly while not driving like i'm not sure why i brought beer if i'm being honest <laughs> it's probably the least useful thing you can have while driving maybe my friend will be more excited to see me i don't know but i i think it's super compelling and a fun mashup of a bunch of things and i'm you know a big fan of of narrative and games and i feel like this is just such a exciting examination of like the road trip game Mm -hmm. and like it's just a funky take on things and i that's that's very much what my taste is especially like looking at games in this very quick demo overview it's like hey what looks like something i sort of haven't seen that i desperately want and then that's usually what kind of clicks for me yeah this one was also on my list and i just played it today and janet i can tell you what happens when you drink a beer it's not good don't drink and drive so you can drink and drive Uh uh-huh you can absolutely drink and drive i thought maybe i could like some you know like i like i could win favor of like the people like on the road you know what i mean like i just know what happens is that it gives you the happy status so that's good 
but it actually puts a timer on your turn during combat. So if you can't get everything, you can't stop and go like, okay, what skills are going to help me the most get rid of all of this stuff? You have to go, 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 or else it's the next turn. So I got absolutely destroyed by a puddle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and the combat is so fun because it is turn-based. It's sort of like match three. Like you are trying to match the icons of your skills with the icons of the... It's like your dash when an icon starts blinking. And you're like, I don't know what that light means. I hope it's not something important because I'm going to keep driving. Um but that sort of like reiterates, Janet, what you were saying about this game having personality. It really, really does. And I'm super excited to see more of it as we go on. But Janet, what's your other game? My other game uh, is Uga, which funny enough, it's kind of like that UFO 50 game. Um, it it reminds like I forgot the one of y'all might know the name of the game I'm talking about from UFO 50, the platformer where you're like killing yourself over and over again. Oh, yeah. Doesn't it start with uh, like a mortal? B? Mortal. Was it mortal? mortal. Okay. So the move, like the general movement reminds me of mortal in that you're like, th so what this is, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, prehistoric kind of character, kind of like a Fred Flintstone vibe of is the main character. It's a platformer, um, probably progressively going to be getting faster and more precise in what you do with the platforming, but you have a spear. That's like one of the early things you get and you're supposed to like throw it into the wall and use it to like traverse, which if you played, was it morsel? Is that what we said mortal. the game's name was? mortal um it has a similar thing but you do that with your body um and i you know i think that game's interesting i think this one's also interesting in its construction of that um i'm always looking for platformers so this is one that i tried to quite a few platformers and this one stood out to me as just a unique angle on like puzzle platformer because i think when we think puzzle platformer it's like you're solving a puzzle while jumping or you jump to like maybe hit the switches to solve whatever puzzle but this is in that vein of puzzle platformer that is more about the puzzle is how do you interact with your environment, which one could argue is technically a lot of platformers. Like platforming is just figuring out space, timing, and jumps. But this kind of adds that other layer of having, you know, spears or like different abilities that you're kind of interacting with. I think my only ding on this game was it seems like the restart is a little like slow. It's like you got to hold it down, then it's like, and now we're back. I'm like, ah, that could, that I could see that being a little bit frustrating as you go on. Like it doesn't have the, immediate snap that like a celester super meat boy has but mm -hmm. um i think the construction is is pretty cool so uh yeah keep an eye out for it q1 2025 or so they say we'll see bum, bum, bum. <laughs> we'll see jenny what are you playing um let's see so the ones that i've gotten to play i think one of them i actually played at pax west and I played the demo in the hopes that they had more content. And I am very happy to say they did. And that is oh, Tethergeist. Nice. Um, yeah, Tethergeist is, we talked about it, I think, when we were in the Pax West episode. But it was basically this puzzle precision platformer where you're moving around, you're platforming in a very Celeste-like manner where you're starting on the left side of the screen, moving to the right, trying to get through any number of obstacles and like traps. And the switch that they added here is that when you're collecting your little energy bubbles to give yourself, yourself like a double jump in Celeste, these energy bubbles allow you to slow time and essentially create a path to teleport yourself uh, to a certain place in, on that level. And so it provides you space to think about your traversal um, and to create it and solve it in a more puzzle-like manner than simply just reflex. And mm -hmm. it gives you time so that if your reflexes are bad, like mine, you have a <laughs> lot of room and forgiveness that can happen in the levels. It's a lot of fun. I actually... Um, played through so in the PAX demo they like stopped before sort of this like you're this character who's going on this coming of age ceremony called the binding and they stopped before this binding ceremony happens um and basically this demo goes past that so we oh, really cool. get to see a little bit more of like the way the puzzles evolve and a little bit more of the story so I was just really happy and that was like not a new one to me but I saw it and i took a chance because I was like if they had just a little more content I would love it and they did so I'm very happy about nice. that um the other demo I played which I think a few others did as well as the Scarlet Deer Inn demo which I hadn't yeah. gotten to try I think it was at 
maybe like a GDC or something, and I didn't get a chance to play. It was also one of those where I'm like, eh, it looks like my jam, so I'm mm-hmm. not going to worry about spending like physical con time on it. Um I thought it was really, really interesting. I think there was elements of it that I wasn't expecting. Um, Scarlet yeah, there Deer, was. Yeah, there's <laughs> a lot to it that uh, is really cool. So Scarlet Deer Inn is a essentially like an adventure platformer. Um, you play as this young woman, a mother, who is the owner of an inn. And in this demo, you basically have to run a few chores for some folks. And during that, something really horrifying happens. Mm-hmm. And you basically have to find your way through these caverns in this um, this sort of like mystical wooded sort of caverny area um the trick to this the mechanic that i didn't know was the mechanic that i love is you don't have any weapons all you have is a torch like a fire torch and you have to keep it lit and your goal is as you're exploring to find other places to sort of re-up your torch because if that fire goes Mm. out and you're left in the darkness that's when something can get you um It was okay. so cool. <laughs> <Do you really laughs> and I will say this game, the hook, the visual hook is that this game is both like digitally painted, but also the characters are embroidered and they mm-hmm. animate embroidery and put it into the game. So there's just really interesting tactile element to the visual, um, to the visual style that I loved and looks really beautiful. Um, and the team is this husband and wife team and they actually like, make all the music together too like they have these uh what is it i almost called it middle earth not middle earth middle age medieval medieval yeah (laughs) instruments and they do all of the music together too so it's just kind of a really cool like very homegrown project but it felt much more polished than i thought uh these adventure style games i get very apprehensive because i feel like the controls often feel very sluggish the controls felt pretty good i will say the one quality of life thing i hope they add are indicators for when you can interact with yes things. yes 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 yeah 100%. i don't know you played it too jill i did any um, any additional thoughts on that It's like, I love it because it looks like you look at some of the screens and it's like green hills and fluffy sheep and all that jazz. And you think it's going to be a very different game than it turns out to be. And I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil anybody for going into it, but I recommended it to Mike, you know? So (laughs) it's dark. It gets, it's like Slavic folktale dark. Yeah. So, (laughs) but yeah, no, that was (laughs) <laughs> that was definitely one of those things that I was like, I need some sort of put the X over things, do a shimmer around it so that yeah. I know that I can interact with it. Um, I I I have actually worked with this team before for when back when I was at Game Informer um, cool. and lovely human beings. And, and you love when you can uh, support and back the people as well as the game. Uh, and this is definitely one of those situations. So go check out Scarlet Deer and it's real good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the last demo, I mean, I admittedly only played five. So this is like my top three out of five. I will come back with more. But uh, Sopa, mm-hmm. I yeah. thought this was so charming. Oh, my gosh. So you play this little boy, Miho, and he he just is told by his grandma to go into the pantry and collect potatoes because she's making soup. And with that begins this like really just imaginative adventure where um, like kids do, you get, you give them a normal task and all of a sudden it becomes like a quest, you know, and very Narnia like in that he goes into the pantry and this frog creature steals the potatoes. And the whole adventure is you trying to get these potato back, uh, potatoes back. Uh, The demo has you going through this like river rafting ride you go into the frog black market and like the characters are just so funny and charming the animation is really well done like there's a moment where there is a frog who like taps his belly uh, to give you like this code (laughs) and you're supposed to hear the rhythm of the code and the animation for that was just so funny and I was smiling the entire time Um, it's a lot of walking around, talking, exploring, getting items, getting them to the right characters. Uh, and then a few like quick timey-esque interactions, I would say is like the mechanic, but it's really meant to be a 
like a charming experience and I am here for it. Uh, it looks a little rough. I will say it ran a little rough on some of the more intensive parts on my computer. Um, yeah. But I think with this kind of game for me, I'm like the charm and the heart within the game and its content. I'm willing to let some of the roughness around the visual edges go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That I had played that. Oh, actually, no, you were there too, Jill. We played it at, um, something we were at that xbox yeah. had <laughs> something together i think that SGF, was GDC? xbox something i don't know it was a room everything was green i was confused i played some good games <laughs> but yeah sopa's so joyful i think it's like really tapping into the magical realism of what it's like to be a child yes. and like mm -hmm. see things through a child's eyes um but also i was re-looking at the steam page uh jill you're quoted in their trailer yeah I don't know if you knew that you yeah they have you over mm -hmm. over there so i was like hey i was like okay so anyway shout out yeah but yeah it, <laughs> it out. was it chucked for some parts during then too i'm still holding on hope that they'll smooth it out but i think like you said even if they don't like it's still totally worth your time mm -hmm. yeah speaking of things that are worth our time mike <laughs> wait mike before yes. you go can i make a request can you start <laughs> with butcher's creek specifically because and i'm not memeing i swear this is true sure this is one of the games that i tried to try and i couldn't do it because it was too scary i got like one minute in and i was like i can't do it it's not for me and i just left yeah and this so is also happens? the game i think that is the reference from your intro if yes I... it is okay mm -hmm. um it looks beautiful by the way i was yeah. very taken by the art but i was like beautiful is a word for it i'm too scared to be here <laughs> um well first off i do want to give a shout out uh the dev behind uh keep driving um his previous game it might be his first game post post void yeah play it it's such Excellent. a banger and so overlooked i just wanted to give a shout out there um and very different from keep driving very different so Butcher's Creek, who uh, I believe it's, oh, which brother is it? Is it John or Evan? It is, oh, David. Uh, this is a David Szymanski <laughs> joint. Uh, these are the folks, if you remember uh, my uh, gushing from earlier in the year, uh, same individual who developed Pony Factory. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 So, uh, this game, he he dropped it on Twitter maybe like a few years back or a couple years back, just saying like, "Hey, I'm a huge fan of Condemned Criminal Origins from the Xbox 360. There's no games really like that anymore, and I wanted to just like mess around in that kind of uh, that that kind of genre. And he, it seems I like he put it down. Going to say that I'm a big fan of Condemned Criminals. <laughs> <laughs> like, I would not have blinked. Big fan. That's what Big fan. Say. Um, it seems like he's put it down for quite a bit. He tweeted it out more recently, maybe like earlier in the year, and like the tweet kind of blew up. He's like, "Okay, I guess I'll start development back up." I was very surprised to see it have a playable build during X Fest, and yes, of course, it was the first thing that I played. Um, I am a huge fan of Condemned Criminal Origins. It is one of my favorite games of all time. I think it is a masterclass in horror. Um, the the kind of staging genre mechanic whatever you want to call it uh first person melee based survival horror game where it's very focused on melee combat and blocking with melee combat and doing the resident evil thing like going around finding keys um condemned in particular you play as a detective and there there's a mechanic where like you're taking photos and getting clues all that kind of stuff that's adapted in butcher's creek so butcher's creek is very much that kind of game mechanically the setup um Granted, not a lot of narrative stuff in the demo, but the setup seems to be you're kind of like infiltrating a cult camp, village, whatever, however big this place is, um, and you get captured and you are trying to escape and find help. Um, it is a grunge horror indie, low poly PS1 VHS aesthetic. Uh, and yeah, it, it as somebody who adores Condemned from Sega, um, it is this is the closest thing that I could possibly imagine uh, that that game being. Like I say, I haven't played a game like this since that, and it feels like it felt like I was just back in the launch Xbox 360 days, like playing that game again. It, I had that like same sensation, which is the best thing I could say about this game. Um, Janet, yes, it is horrifying. Um, <laughs> the the opening <laughs> segment before it got scary. I was like, I picked up the hammer sure. and I was opening did, up did you, that like, so, area. Did you encounter an enemy? Because like even before you encounter <laughs> an enemy, it's horrifying. Yeah, it yeah. does. 
it does such a fantastic job of just setting tone because it is so dark and grimy and quiet. Like it does, the sound design is so goddamn good in this game where it does create that atmosphere, which Janet, I'm sure you've had that reaction of like, you just want to get the hell out and you don't want to see what's behind that door. That you're Not really. So like the, the, what okay. Jill was referring to, like what jump scared me was like, I was screwing around on stream, like singing bones by the killers. And I turned around and all of a sudden there was a man <laughs> there and scared the hell out of me. So like there's men that will pop out of nowhere that you have to, beat with a hammer scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm, it was really a mike created situation <laughs> maybe yes. i should try it again because i really did just like it's like you ever like you pull up somewhere it's like it's like you ever step into a store and then you like look at the price of one item and you're like i shouldn't be in the store that's how <laughs> sure. i felt walking into that game <laughs> where i'm like this was on my wish it was one of the games on my wish list because i saw it thought it looked cool and i'm trying to you know yeah. I, one day i'll break out and be able to play scare games but it has such like a great look. It is that PS1 look, but it's so low res, high res. Yeah. If that makes sense. It's like, it, it feels so real. Look, even though it's like, it's PS1, so it's not realistic, but it is, it's like, it's real to me in that moment. And I think it just, oh, it fits it so well, but I'm like, great environment you made. I'm going <laughs> to exit this. Nope. I'm out of here. And I'm like, you know what? I'll find a different game to recommend. Yeah, the, the environments are fantastic. The the combat feels really great. It does uh it has that condemned camera mechanic where you're you take a, you take photos of like murder scenes. Um and that's your way to get health back. And the more gruesome the scene is, the more health you get back. Um also has a really, really cool save mechanic where it kind of adapts the Resident Evil save mechanic where you're finding like in, in like old school Resi games, you find the ink ribbons and like you use the ink ribbons to save the game. Mm -hmm. This game has that you you find VHS tapes around the entire game and you can use a VHS tape to save your game. But the VHS tapes also give you more health. So you can hang on to up to five VHS tape, tapes to give yourself more health. Um, but it's kind of like a risk or reward of like, oh, do I want a sliver of more health or do I want to save the game right now? Mm -hmm. And you can only hold mm -hmm. up to five at a time. And the VHS tapes also, um, it seems like in the demo, there was, it was like very much like a critical path kind of thing, but the VHS tapes also unlock doors as well. So you have, oh, it's kind of like a risk or reward kind of thing of like, okay, do I want to give up three tapes to see what's behind this door? It is really damn good. I, I cannot wait to to play more of it. I didn't finish the demo just because I was like 45 minutes into it. Like, cool, I'm sold. Like they're 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 hitting all the right notes. They they nailed the assignment. Cool, all in. Um, but yeah, easily my favorite thing so far of Next Fest, obviously, as cliche as that sounds. Um, yeah. No, I love that you saw the exact same thing Janet did, and you're like, cool, all in. And Janet's like, nope, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Um Love the work that the Szymanski brothers do. Um, I think it's Evan who put out Exiled that I also talked about with Pony Factory. He is doing something a lot more wholesome looking. I forgot the exact name of the game, but it's essentially a a, a, a goof on like Harry Potter. And it's like <laughs> you're a, a wizard in a school, but you're like you're also a criminal and you're just like causing a, a chaos in the school i have it downloaded it has a very long comical name but very excited for that it's like untitled well. goose game but you're a wizard kind of let me let me see if i can a, find a it. wizard crimi criminal we need a name for that downloaded. genre by the way um the goose game genre untitled yeah goose like game the genre, you know check troublesome list. scamp or something like there's some troublesome there scamp. it's like <laughs> it's, a, it's a scamp like <laughs> Oh, uh, so secret agent wizard yes. boy and the international crime syndicate. <laughs> yes. yes, it is. Uh, oh, that's perfect. So that's developed by John and Evan Sinsmaski, published mm -hmm. by David Sinsmaski. So three brothers. Um, secret agent wizard boy must go undercover to topple Grumble Mort's evil crime syndicate, <laughs> hidden beneath his wizarding school, learn spells, engage in espionage, and spread utter love, utter lore, unfriendly chaos. Very excited for that. Um, but I have not played it yet and I would just went on a tangent. Uh, the other things I played, I only played three demos so far. Um, so it was, yeah, Butcher's Creek. Um, I did play Windblown, which I know you guys talked about last week when I had a bounce. Windblown, very cool. Excited for Go it. Go check it out. Yeah, yeah. I can't believe it's coming out already in a couple of weeks. That's wild. Next week, I think. I, mm -hmm. Is that really? Oh, yeah. Dang. Yeah. 
crazy. <gasps> Time. Um, but yeah, I, I it yeah the Hades formula, top down roguelike whatever. I really like the combination mechanic where after, it was an aftershock or something it's called. I think that's like something like that. Yeah, I think that's a very unique kind of twist to it that like got my hooks in even deeper. Very cool. Uh, but the other thing I played was the Spirit of the Samurai, um, which has been shown during various showcases. I think it premiered during a future game show uh, a couple yeah. years back. You and I watched this, I think. Yeah. Um, so it is a 2D platform action game, very similar to like a Trek to Yomi. You play as a samurai, you're, you're fighting against undead monsters, all that kind of stuff. I think the, the unique thing about it is it's sort of claymation-y in a way. Like certain aspects are like claymation-y, which gives it a very unique aesthetic. Um, it's gorgeous to look at. It runs beautifully on the Steam Deck. Um, the coolest thing about it is the combat system. So the combat system, it's all tied to the right stick. So you could have your sword like it, let's say you just go you know up down left right you can hit right twice and you have like a certain combination with your sword hit up twice it's a different combination with your sword so on and so forth um that is also tied to the unlockables where you unlock different moves for your swords and okay. each combination has two slots for a certain swing a certain maneuver and you could swap those maneuvers in and out so like if i want my double right to be two specific moves. I could swap them in via the menu. Really cool. Really, really unique. Um, the game is like very dense in its like systems and tutorials and stuff. So there were some things that kind of like flew over my head a little bit, but um, super into it in terms of like the combat and the feel and the look and like some of the narrative stuff that's going on. Um, really interesting. I think a launch date just got announced. I think it's December. It's a December joint. So fitting in right before the uh, end of the year and before the Game Awards. Yeah. So something to check out during holiday breaks, maybe. Uh, but yeah, that's all I played so far. I, as you guys were talking, I did download 25 more things. Yeah, that no, that's the problem with this. It's <laughs> like, now I'm going to go play this 100%. And like, Jill, um, you were saying like, you know, surprises and like things that like maybe that weren't on our radar that, you know, whatever. Um, I didn't know there was another Orbo game uh, that is, is part of Next Fest. Orbo's Odyssey is a very good bite-sized uh, 3D platformer. Orbo's Exodus is on here. Um, Pip My Dice is a Yahtzee roguelike. Are you kidding me? I'm very excited for that. Okay. okay. Um, Gotta go see it. We're, we've been doing pretty good with these uh, classic board game roguelikes. So yeah, far. I didn't play the, was it Dungeons and Gamblers? Dungeons, Ga Dungeons and Degenerate Gamblers. Mm. It was pretty fun. It was pretty I, fun. I haven't played it yet. The one I'm most <laughs> intrigued for, and it's it seems like a uh, inscription like, um, is this game trying to kill me? I don't know if that's been oh, on anybody's radar okay, yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -mm. Seems interesting. So that's uh, it's next on the list. So many things on the list. So many things on the list. And I'm about to add three more. Are you ready? Yep. Uh, I played Citizen Sleeper 2. It is meaty. We talked about Janet, uh, like, these demos don't have a time limit sometimes i'm really happy for that because i want to be able to dig in and see what's going on uh citizen sleeper 2 is one of those instances i'm very intrigued by the fact that they have added the so much narrative in the beginning there is a lot of buildup in the way that these games have a lot of narrative uh citizen sleeper 1 very similar layout if you've played the first one you understand how this works um i was really interested to see how they were going to deal with the fact that the first game is narratively speaking a branching narrative and you make a lot of choices that change a lot of things that happen they have dealt with that very interestingly uh i don't want to spoil anything but they've done that very well this game continues to be astounding astounding in its concept astounding in its writing i oh, i got through like an hour and a half and i'm not done with this demo so oh, wow so that's where we are. It's meaty and you definitely need to go check it out. Um, Keep Driving was also on my list, but we talked about that. So then third, I want to shout out Nights in Tight Spaces. Um, this is a follow-up game. Originally, it was Fights in Tight Spaces. Uh, so it was a little play on words. Um, it's got a very beautiful, like, wood-carved aesthetic to it. But it is essentially... Um, 
you have cards and those are your actions and you plan things out space by space on a grid and you're trying to take out a bunch of enemies in tight spaces and uh, it's a really good fun strategy game i think the first time i played this was gdc uh so i'm really happy to see it here and to continue to be able to check it out so go and try that as well um that is next fest so far i'm sure they will probably have some things to talk about next week uh, as to hopefully we find new and fun things to play. And speaking of playing games, let's try games we've been playing. I know a lot of us have one particular game on on the playlist or have played it, uh, and that's Never. And Jenny, I am dying to know what you think of Never. So run me down. What are you feeling? No um, spoilers, please. I won't spoil <laughs> it for sure because I know it is freshly out so if folks are also wanting to you know play it and experience it for themselves don't worry we won't spoil anything um if you are unfamiliar i think it's neva when you press the thing the the character say i think she pronounces it neva and it's by nomada studio and evolver digital and you may be familiar with greece which is the previous title that the studio did um i think I you say like you, you may be familiar with evolver hotline miami <laughs> Hotline Miami. Yeah. Um, I can say unequivocally, this is like one of the most beautiful games. Just every every scene, every moment could be its own screenshot, could be its own art piece. Um, it's beautiful. The music, orchestral, emotional. Um, if you are a person who cries, you probably will cry. Like I am a crier and I honestly cried probably at the very start of the game multiple times in the middle and then I like ugly cried at the end so yeah. just know there are tears to be had if you're a person who has tears like that um and I found it to be really really solid it was this beautiful solid game I will say there is a lot of similarities in terms of stro story structure um but I don't think that's a bad thing I think why mess with the formula if it's like really solid? And they mm -hmm. did add elements that I think made it interesting and showed growth from their first game. Specifically, this game does have combat. Um, you can choose a, a story mode so that the combat doesn't, you know, really impede your progression through the story. But if you choose adventure mode, um, you basically have three hit points. And if you get hit three times in battle, you got to try again and start from the beginning of that battle. So I thought that added a level of challenge um, that wasn't present in the first game. And I thought the platforming felt much stronger, <laughs> like the puzzle platforming much stronger than Greece. Yes. So overall, highly recommend, especially if you like your first first game. Yeah, a yeah. hundred uh, percent. I'm with you with the crying. There are times when you're like, just, it's just coming down your face. I'm like, I'm, I'm still playing because it's beautiful, but oh my God. Yeah. I love the the conceit of the narrative that mm -hmm. sort of reveals itself through time. You're like, oh, I love the playing of time and the way that time is a big part of this game. And yeah. I'm trying really hard not to say anything that's going <laughs> to spoil anything. Yeah. Uh, is it, I also... Well, is is are you nope. able to say is it a, is yeah. it a, is it a timey wimey game? It's a timey wimey game. It's not a timey wimey game. Ah, okay. Uh, sort of. Still down. <laughs> no, I, I start at like ten minutes. Not in the it, way so I think that you are asking close. that question. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, it's a seasons game. Yeah, okay. each chapter is a different season, and every season you get that beautiful foliage change. Everything is like motif and themed and it was, oh man, I love this game so much this is my game of the year so far um, oh wow. wow yeah no 100% I love 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 this game I I love the the companions in games can be a little tough sometimes because sometimes they're annoying or whatever of course this is a wolf that your is your companion so you don't have that situation where it's like hey look over here uh you can pet the wolf at any point and a lot of times you pet the wolf for particular reasons um which makes me feel very bonded to my companion character and everything that goes on with neva um 
I liked the combat. I think the combat is a lot. It's very straightforward. Um, you do only have three hit points, but you heal every time you hit. Mm -hmm. So it is that mm. it is a very good back and forth of just make sure that you hit the thing and you don't get hit. <laughs> um, yeah. I love the way that the fights work. They are a lot more puzzly than combat-y uh, to my mind. You you kind of puzzle out how this works. Um, I love the way that I, I can't I can't talk about some of the things, but it's like there's a lot of like Princess Mononoke specific vibes for me in this game. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you caught that like during a couple of the boss battles or the other like kind of mid battles. I was like, oh, man, I'm feeling this. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, if that's a touchstone for you that you like that, this is definitely a game you want to check out uh platforming again yeah really good i really enjoyed it for the most part you just can't pick your jaw up off the ground for how beautiful this game is um so it's about five hours long it took me about five hours to finish so it's not a long game you can do it in a weekend or if if you're really determined in one sitting um there are little collectibles you can go around and collect like their little plants if you would like to challenge yourself to try more things um but yeah absolutely gorgeous gorgeous game love it i want everybody literally everybody should stop what they're doing and go play this right now so sorry um, sorry for the amazon notification <laughs> <laughs> i i didn't find that funny know. yeah <laughs> i hope you feel bad mike I could share. Oh, <laughs> Look what I got. What'd you get? Don't show your address. Something oh, Sonic related. It. Yay! Oh, oh, yeah, physical edition of the Bellatra. physical edition. Oh, okay. That's cool. Which I think comes with cards. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't play anything. This is my contribution. <laughs> I mean, it's a game. Yeah. I did play the cards as your. I did uh, play it on my uh, my phone last night because I couldn't sleep. Yeah. It's good oh, on phone. It's fun. It's really good. Okay. Super random phone tangent, but I have not been able to stop playing Word Salad. Yes, Which Janet. Janet, you have destroyed my life. I, I low key turned on Word Salad because I'm too dumb to solve the puzzles. <laughs> you turned on Word Salad. <laughs> yeah, because it's like it is fun, but it's like sometimes I'm like I don't know what you want from me, and then sometimes I'm like oh I see what you want, and I'm mad you asked for it. So I'm just mm -hmm. like a mm -hmm. just a bad gamer for Word Salad, but I'm glad you guys are. Yeah, that you latched onto also, it. Oh man, every night I do at least one puzzle. <gasps> open them up, show <laughs> them, show yeah. them. Do I want to open them? I'll do what if they're collector's yeah. item? <laughs> well, you already opened the game. Yeah. But for a while, me and Isaiah were doing like the dailies at the same time, and then we'd like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, it doesn't count as using a hint if I ask you because it's different. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I don't want to use a hint. That's like, I will be, I will sit in a puzzle for like days if I must, you know, just to not have to like use a hint. Because, yeah, that's the kind of stubborn I am. <laughs> For sure. uh, I think the other... It's really funny. Jenny and I have almost every of the same game. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've both played Grun. Um, there we go. Nice. Mike is the showing off the video. Those Beautiful are the aces. Cards. Continue Beautiful speaking cards. while I show them um, off. Jenny and I played Grun. And Grun, <clears throat> I did not expect to hit me as hard as it did. I rated this game very high. You can go check the review out on the Indian Former. Um, there is something about games which create knowledge as a part of the game as an upgrade that I am mm. absolutely in love with and run all you need to do. Cause it is a, it is a timey wimey game. It is uh, over okay, and over sweet. again. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it is a roguelike where you Hell are yeah, going to be dying. Does Steam have time again. fest? I think they Honestly, did. They, they probably timey -wimey fest? They, had a t they timey -wimey should call fest? it timey wimey fest, but I think they had a looping game fest. Time time. Yeah, they time did time. have, cause the, uh, your game was in there. You like the game that you love say, say the princess was in there yeah. and they had yeah. a, the time thing. Yeah. And a loop thing, yeah, loop fest. But, yeah. Yes, so Grun is definitely a loop game, and you are going to be looping over and over again. But the thing is, it's a totally normal gardening simulator. You don't need to worry about anything. Nothing bad happens in this game. Um, oh, that Jill immediately. So is this game scary? 
is Jill is immediately like DM'd me, was like, the, you we, need to play this. So, yeah, yes, I'm sure. This. It's like the best kind of scary, and then it's not yeah. actually, like, it's like scary on rails. So it's like the first time you go through loops, and the first time you discover certain secrets, you're like, oh my god, what's going to happen? But mm-hmm. once you understand the loop, it becomes less scary because you know that when things happen um sure, so yeah. it was like exactly the kind of scary i liked where it was like initially a little scary it's always a little weird but you're not like terrified yeah the entire time. it's more a little weird it's more hints of like mm-hmm. i'm playing uh, like you go through and you like you you've been hired to uh upkeep maintenance this person's garden so you're like you've got shears and you're cutting grass and you get a percentage of uh how much grass you've cut and like that is part of the game a big part of getting some secrets is figuring out like okay i've i've clipped the grass i've cut the hedges i've watered the flowers um and then you just wander across like oh that's a dead body <laughs> that's probably nothing and you just continue on uh with your life so it's just yeah, job an job, amazing you know? yeah, <laughs> yeah part exactly. of the job part of the job is a as a landscaper you unlock more and more areas like there's a park there's a cathedral there's a little village things happen at different times so you start on like friday i want to say um and there's a time element you don't want to stay out after dark um (laughs) you go back and you go to sleep and you don't worry about it uh and things happen on different days and different things are going on so the more you learn like, oh, this is going to happen on this day. So this is where I want to be. This is where this implement is kept so that I can get this faster. Like by the end, something that took you 20 minutes in the beginning of the game, you're done in a second because you're like, I know to get this, this and this. Boom. I'm on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. So even though you are restarting a loop, you don't restart because you've already attained to that knowledge, yeah. which is great for like... I love Hades, but every time you have to go through and you have to defeat every single thing again, you have to go through every bad guy again, you have to go through every area again. Like, I get really frustrated when I die in a game like that. For this particular game, it's like you've attained knowledge. You don't have to worry about it. You know where to go. Um, and the the ending... I, this game wasn't as high on my list until I got to the ending. And oh my god, do I love the ending of this game. It is so bizarre and fucking how did we get here kind mm-hmm. of situation. And I accidentally like did the 100% good ending situation. So I love it. I don't know, Jenny, how did you feel about it? I mean, I I was already very much looking forward to this game. I had played the demo a while back. I knew I was like, this is exactly like, this is my shit. I love this. Um, <laughs> it's got time loops. It's got like cathartic power wash sim style cleaning, basically mm-hmm. with the gardening. Yeah. Um, it's weird. And playing it, I think I finished it in two sessions. I've like basically 100% of this game, um, gotten every achievement. It's It's like... And it did not disappoint for me. No. Um, I, I'm i a huge Outer Wilds fan. Like ever since I played Outer Wilds and I was like, that game is like the pinnacle of using knowledge to solve puzzles and like figure out loops. Ever since that game, I'm like chasing the next time loopy knowledge game. And this is like, it's nowhere, it's not philosophical like Outer Wilds. You're not going to like have this deep existential crisis, but it's got this like, it makes you feel super smart. And by the end, I felt like a speed runner. So I felt really cool. Like, Mm -hmm. and the way it allows you to discover the secrets to get through these shortcuts, like you were saying, things that took you 20 minutes will take you like two and you will feel like a genius when you play. And so by the end, I was like, oh, I got this. And I was moving so fast and it just was so much fun to play. Like I did not want the game to end. I will play anything this developer makes next. Like I just had a great time with it. So it's, I highly recommend it. Um, And I think, uh, I don't think the demo is available anymore, which is so sad because I'm just like, I wish I could say, just play the demo. And if you like that, you're in, but I mean, just get the game. It's good. What's the, uh, what's the runtime on it? Um, For me, it took me eight hours to a hundred percent it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll yeah, say it was three to four range. on Helena Beat. 
Yeah. So, and yeah, you definitely don't need all of it. I just was like so right. into it. Yeah. Sure. And um, it also you know, really hinges on what you find and how long it sure. takes you to find stuff. Mm-hmm. Do you, you know offhand, Jenny, if you got like the good ending or the bad ending? Did you look up like the other endings? Like, like the thing is for this game, you get all the endings. Like you'll get oh. all of it. Yeah. I guess don't say more. <laughs> as, <laughs> I'm intrigued by how, I mean, Okay. Yeah, you'll get sure. collect I, endings. Yeah, you'll collect I have so endings. many endings. I don't yeah, have all the not, endings though. I guess I'm not gonna lie; it's not a competition. But like, y'all sold me on this like much more than Neva, even though Neva, Neva is like pretty looking and like I started it and it seems cool. But like, this is I'm intrigued and I'm confused and I'm a little concerned. So I'll download it. <laughs> Why yeah. not? Add it to the pile. Yeah, yeah. those, those for are all me, the things you should feel. Oh, yeah, I was like, this is a this is one of those standout gems that I feel like more people should be talking about. Honestly. Yes, one hundred percent. All right, all right. Janet, grab this go. big Steam Deck. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think we're gonna round out with Jenny and Europa. What? Yeah. How are you feeling about Europa? Um, you know, honestly, I thought Europa was all right. Like, yep. I think. Yep. It's a really – so Europa is a game where you play as sort of this android named C. Um, you are sort of the only humanoid person on this planet of – I forget. It was the Jupiter moon. Europa. Your title. Yep. Um, and your mission is basically to explore this world and figure out what happened to the rest of the humans who are part of the colony there. Um, I think – for me, Europa was really beautiful. Like technically everything felt really lovely. You spend a lot of the time traversing and like gliding, uh, kind of like for folks who are familiar with that game companies, like flower or journey, it seems to draw a lot of inspiration from that type of movement where you are like gathering, um, basically these sparkly spark gems to sparkly increase, spark gems yeah sparkly spark gems that increase the duration of your glide and so that you have more freedom to traverse um and the story i feel like is if you've seen any sort of like conflict with robots and nature kind of, you probably can pick up what the story is putting down relatively quickly um i think What's tough is especially compared to games like Neva that just come out, which address similar vibes, aesthetics, and feelings. Um, it's kind of a tough time for it to be out. Um, yeah. I also just on a mechanical level found that there are a lot of times when I was grounded in the game. And I think the expectation that a lot of their marketing had set for me that it was like mostly about this freeform traversal. And that was true for maybe the first half of the game, but the second half is a lot more platforming, which I looked up and technically they do mention platforming on the Steam page, but I was really looking forward to the sell of this like exploration. And I felt like in that last section of the game, I was like, "Ah, I feel like it's either too much on rails or I'm like platforming more than feeling this like freedom of traversal. So that was just like a personal gripe that I had about it but like a very solid game worth exploring if you have the time it's just hard because there are a lot of really really strong games out right now and so yeah. for me it's like a little bit lower on that scale if I had to pick yeah I'm in the first half of the game so like I'm still in that like I'm floating everywhere it's beautiful it looks like a Ghibli game like mm-hmm. it's definitely a vibe it is a yeah. vibe game um yeah, so I'm going to have to check more of that out and see what's going on in the second half. But let's head on to Janet. What have you been playing? Yeah, so I did the unthinkable. I dared to <laughs> charge my play date and play the <laughs> So everybody clap, you know. Okay. Um, yeah, like, I, you know, the play date is like a lot of things in the gaming space. Like, we often buy things just to have it, just, you know, mm-hmm. fill up a digital library, add something to the shelf. And I definitely think the play date is you know it's fine to have it in that capacity and i knew when i got it that like outside of my initial review how long will i hang out with it i don't know you know but it's there whenever i want it um i did despite not having played it for like most of the time that i've had it buy the 30 or 50 dollar pizza case cover because it looks so cool and i'm like okay this cover is gonna help incentivize me to play the game no it's not but i'm like you know i'm like i'm gonna get back into it and um Mm -hmm, i mm -hmm. had the i might i might try to pull up the name of the person because i actually had the developer reach out to i think initially patrick klepek from remap 
Okay. Um, about let me see here it goes. Okay, cool. Saying like, hey, I know you guys like platformers, so like, here's you know some code for the game or whatever. Um, the game is called Off Planet Dreams. Um, it is. Do I have? It's made by Lead Better Games. Uh, six bucks plus tax, and it's really fascinating because it is an invisible platformer. You are a little like square and you're moving you're trying to get to the door it's like a one screen kind of setup of a game and there's like little dots kind of like a picture like dotted paper like a sheet of dotted paper that's the level your little blob there's a door but you don't know where any of the platforms are and you're just kind of trying to memorize where they are but they also have other modes where like they have a, a peak button where you can see a platform if it's close enough to you before you get on it, they have a paint version where you can leave a trail as you touch platforms, and that allows you to, as you explore the space, add the visible platforms. And then there's also just, like, you can just show the thing. Like, you can just set it to where it shows you where, like, the platforms are. And in that sense, it's not necessarily a game of difficult jumps, but it's a game of memorization. And also, I think, trying to play Guess Where I Put the Platform, which I think is a little <laughs> bit fun in like a meta development way where you start off with a level it's like okay it's probably just going to be like here's where i think i would put them and it's like well they're probably doing something different you know if if i can see the door they probably like make me loop around so let me guess that and then you kind of retrial and error that so i think it's really fascinating in that sense um and definitely worth checking out i think especially if you're if you're into platformers there's not as much things there as there were in like 1997 you know i'm sure you noticed right so i think this is just like a fun creative take on it um and it's one of those games too where like it, it being on the play date this tiny little device like sitting in bed holding it next to my lamp because i didn't buy the headlight that mike recommended that i get it's like there's something <laughs> that feels so pure about a game like that that's just like it's so minimalist that it becomes like exciting again in a way for me at least and for me and my sensibilities so yeah i'm really enjoying that and it definitely had me being like okay what else should i be checking out on the play date i also thought it was like super easy to like add on games i was kind of shocked with how easy it was because i in my it's head awesome. i felt like i had to pl i'm like oh well surely i'm gonna have to like plug it in and like download it's like you just click it's ready now like it just downloads it has the gift animation like all the other ones like it was it was dangerously quick, so I'm like, hmm, what else is on there, dude? That's and like I forget how many games are on there now. It's like in the, it's like, is it? It's like a lot of games. I, it's, it's I a learned it today. And I forgot how yeah. many. That's, that's like um, even like downloading stuff off itch. It is surprisingly super simple to just sideload a game via itch.io. It just drag and drop yep. on the website, and it pops on your console. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So that's dangerous. Um, Very and then dangerous. the other game I've been playing, uh is beastie ball i did the um what would it like the the play test window but like the press play test one you know they kind of like gave some some press access to it um ahead of their play test that they have like already available if you want to sign up and be part of it and i don't remember offhand if they also have a demo separate from that currently i know they have it there point. is a next fest demo. The next fest. yeah okay yeah. cool uh beastie ball is awesome um this is my third time getting hands-on with the game, but the first time I actually know what the game is because I think it has so many <laughs> systems going on uh -huh. that it's really hard to, like, showcase it at a con. And, like, that was something that, you know, I, I mentioned yes. when we talked about our pack stuff where the devs are very forthcoming about, like, yeah, you know, people kind of get a sense of what it might be, but it's not really, you know, necessarily coming through without, like, more tutorialization and that's really hard to do at a con, but, you know, all of that. So... Um, this is a, it's kind of like, po it's Pokemon meets volleyball with, and it's more volleyball than Pokemon, if that matters to anyone or does anything for them. It's very like turn-based kind of tactics game in a way that Pokemon isn't quite. I would say it's mostly Pokemon in the uh, way you kind of have the random encounters with like creatures, the way that you can like catch a creature by like giving them a jersey. It's like, that's basically like they're form of a pokeball but it's so much more dynamic in its gameplay than i would typically say a pokemon game is because pokemon's very you know it's very elemental right it's very baseline and elemental as well where it's like okay i use this type against this type but here they don't have types they just have like attributes they kind of spec into like power mind and there's like one other one 
so any you can have any mat matchup of uh beasties like which are like these little animals that play on this volleyball team that played like the game beastie ball you can have any combination of them they can have it's very anime so they can like have like relationships together they can have best friends or partners or like rivals and that changes like how they interact and without getting too into the weeds of the systems because there are a lot of them i think it's really fascinating that there's also a lot of play with status effect even when it's negative like there are you know you're used to like negative status effects in games usually the first thing you want to do is just like get rid of it or hope it wears off but here they'll have something like okay if you, one of your beasties is sweaty there might be a move where it's like when they're sweaty this does extra damage and it's like oh maybe now i'm playing this meta game where i'm like almost trying to have a negative thing happen so i can have this other positive thing happen and there's all this playing with like, the front line the back line it's it is really really cool and really deep and really charming as well the writing is very funny like i pulled up to beastie ball as a big fan of chicory being like all right i ain't gonna lie this don't look anything like chicory but like we ride you know it's like i don't know um <laughs> and I, the more i play it the more i'm like y'all so know what you're doing you so know what that this is like a good genre pivot to make like y'all delivered i think it's super fun super cool there's many more things I could say about it, but uh, yeah, I'm like, I think I played like five or so hours. So yeah, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, we had Charles Hart do this preview for the Indian farmer. Thank you, Charles. You're awesome. Um, and he was basically saying the same thing. Um, I am really excited to jump into this Steam Next Fest demo because the only tastes of BC Ball that I've had have been like, 15 minute you know appointment to appointment sort of situation and I'm like I don't really get what's going on here and I feel like that's been a lot of people's experience so far so I'm hearing people super excited about this now so I really really want to check this out and see I want to get on this train I want to be a BC ball fan I want to jersey I think you're gonna you know? love it because I feel like you <laughs> I feel like personable writing and characters really seems to resonate with you and I think this game totally has that mm -hmm. and it, obviously it is pulling from pokemon but it does a lot of different things than pokemon but at the same time i'm like looking at some stuff and i'm like i wish pokemon did that where it's like yeah. the gym leaders are gym leaders quote unquote it's like they're not really called that but you know they have like such different attitudes and flavors to them where like there's like the one that's washed who's like your town's like like a leader or whatever coach like ranked coach is what they're called and then there's the one who's like she the coach is basically just to make a living but she writes on the side and she's like not really that interested in facing you and there's like little very light like tasks you do to like unlock even getting to like face the ranked coach where like for her you just have to like find her and talk to her um there's another one where he's like oh i want an audience so you have to like find bored people in town and talk to them and then the most fun one was there was one where it's like they're in a club and you like go it's like it becomes like a text adventure where it's mm -hmm. like where do you want to go in the club? And it's like, oh, you realize that your face is really dirty. So you go to the bathroom, you're waiting in line. You're still waiting in line. And it like plays with that over and over <laughs> again. And then like at one point, you're just like dancing really fast. And Lena reigns back on the OST for this. And like, there's a lot of fun that Lena has with this OST, especially like, that dance segment. Like it was so silly and like intentionally dumb. And I'm like, oh my God, I just know you had fun making this. Like it just feels... Like you feel the fun of that in the creation, like in the gameplay as the player, at least like I did playing it. So I'm I think this is gonna be like kind of a big deal. Like I feel like people will be playing and talking about Beastie Ball whenever it does come out. Yeah. Everyone go check out that demo Steam Next Fest. I'm so ready for it. I'm so excited. I'm it's like one of those demos where I'm like, I almost don't know if I wanna play it because I know I'm gonna play the full yeah. launch you know yeah but i'm also just very it's excited fair. to play <laughs> it's like i'm me there with, with um, closed yeah i was thinking oh, golden yeah. idol yeah and that was also on my wish list and then i was like i've got to i don't know if i want to play this either <laughs> i'm scared yeah. of my wish list guys i have a lot it's of horror games that I, I mean, i'll give them the download on there i'll give them the download for the data for the algorithm but i won't play yep it. nice <laughs> i'll launch it I won't <laughs> as a treat play uh, I think the last ones, I just want to do quick shout outs. Uh, speaking of kind of silly, absurd things, Duck Paradox uh, came mm. out earlier this month. It is so ridiculously silly. I love this game. Um, I got to play a little bit of it and I want to play more. Essentially, the setup is you are a scientist and you have a duck. 
who is your best friend. Uh, and one day, unfortunately, the duck uh, gets in with your experiment and is like scattered across the multiverse. So it's your job to jump into your portal and jump through every variation of where this duck is to go and find the duck so you jump in it's like a challenge room sort of thing like it can be platforming it can be combat it can be a combination of of, or it could be puzzle a combination of all three um but your job is to find your way through the level find quark who is your duck which i find that a very funny scientific name for your duck um and it's that variant of the duck so when you bring you find it, bring it back to the portal where you started, then you have to defend it by shooting like multiversal energy demon ducks. <laughs> um, and then when you succeed, that duck becomes a power up. So you can pick it to be like a super fast duck and then it gets a super fast duck outfit and you go to the next level and then that duck is with you. So by the end of the loop, and I think there are seven uh seven challenges to a loop you have like seven ducks trailing after you and it's really funny like hilarious and silly and then you have like a boss battle and everything is very clever it's very well put together it's a lot of fun and a lot of ducks so go check that out uh last shout out is speed llama which is more ridiculous if you want to believe that you play as a llama you're in the middle of the llama um alpaca feud and your job is to go through each level shooting horrifically destroying all of the alpacas in your way collecting gems that unlock the door to the exit it's it's so ridiculous and over the top and gory and uh timed so you have to go super fast it's frantic and ridiculous and, you know, I'm up for it. It is coming out next week, I want to say, on the 21st. Um, so go check that out. But, yeah, I think that is everything we have been playing, unless I missed anything. I don't think I did. So that's the end of this week's council. Thank you, for everybody, for joining us. It's always nice to have a full council. I hope everybody who is watching uh, is enjoying all of these different games. And Oh, got to Everybody watching. I was doing a... <laughs> oh, oh, you're doing the watch. I'm like, oh, he's signaling. He wants to say something. No. Um, go ahead and down in the comments. Tell us what demos you're playing. Tell us what's good. We need to make sure to get everything in by the end of the week. Um, the Indie Council is on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It has its own socials on Twitter and everywhere else. Blue Sky. Go check out Blue Sky. Twitter. I was yeah, literally we're, we're, just thinking, I'm like, yeah. it's time to blow it up on Blue Sky. <laughs> yeah, we are Blue Sky Threads. Instagram is uh the at the indie council but this session is closed go play some indies i lost my mouse where's my mouse no Ah! oh there it is